Welcome, everybody, to another edition of All In with Art Stapleton, a New York Giants podcast brought to you by NorthJersey.com and The Record. I am your host, Art Stapleton, and I know sometimes it feels like I'm banging my head against a brick wall, but we are back at our wall behind the Giants training facility here at MetLife Stadium, or at least the shadow of MetLife in East Rutherford. Sunday Night Football, Giants, Bengals. How you feeling, Giants fans? Two and three, do you feel like your season is stabilized? You have things on the board. I'm wearing my Yankees hat from 2009, the last World Series, the last World Series appearance for the Yankees. Big win last night. Yankees, Mets. Producer Paul Wood is a Mets fan, so we got a little Subway Series brewing here on the All In podcast. But another big game for the Giants this week, and it's only big because they were able to pull off the upset in Seattle. Then you end up watching that game in Seattle last night, Thursday night football against the 49ers. And let's be honest, the pass rush for Seattle that was dormant against the Giants all of a sudden showed life against San Francisco. The San Francisco pass rush stonewalled essentially last night a lot against the the Seahawks. Giants in the trenches really have made a big leap. And I think that will be a big key this weekend, Sunday night, against the Giants. Now, against the Bengals. All right, let's go to some numbers. Daniel Jones, 1-14 in in games he started in primetime. Not good. The only win, 2022, the game that was flexed into primetime in December against Washington, down in Landover. Of course it was the Commanders. Daniel Jones always beats the Commanders. Well, except for week two. But... We'll get to that in a couple weeks when they see Washington again, the first place Washington commanders in the NFC East. So Daniel Jones, primetime, 1-14. and I laid it out all for you on NorthJersey.com. We went game by game. Let's be honest, the Giants have not been favored in many games when they've played in primetime. I think it's one game. They were double-digit underdogs, according to Vegas and the odds makers five different times out of those games. Now, we did not include the playoff game that started at 4.30. That was the national window in Minnesota that the Giants ended up winning. So if you want to throw that as a quote-unquote primetime game, even though they didn't play it in primetime, you can throw that there. Uh, But it's been a lot of losing in primetime. Some of that has to do with the opponents that the Giants are playing. You know, when things weren't going well this past decade – They were playing big-time teams because they wanted the New York market in prime time. Think about it. Tampa Bay Bucks against Brady in 2020. No fans in the stands, but they played. Again, a year later, they were in Tampa Bay in prime time on a Monday night football game. They played in Kansas City, a game they should have won. They should have beaten Tampa that year. Who will forget the Golden Tate touchdown catch and then the controversial flag on the two-point conversion, and then they picked it up, the referees, and gave Tampa Bay the win. That Kansas City game and Arrowhead against Mahomes and the Chiefs, Giants get the stop, get the interception of Patrick Mahomes to win that game. And O'Shane Zimenez, remember that name, he jumps off sides. They end up driving down the length of the field. Harrison Butker kicks the game-winning field goal. So, there's a lot, there's a story inside the story for the Giants prime time issues that they've had with Daniel Jones at quarterback. So can the Giants beat the one and four Bengals? It's going to be an interesting game. I think it'll come down to how the defense plays up front. Can they play well? So let's go to the injury updates that I'm sure you're all waiting for. Malik Neighbors will not play Sunday night. Still in the concussion protocol. Still has not advanced to the non-contact portion of practice. So he will not play. Now, I have a couple theories on this. I think the Giants are not necessarily slow playing it, but they're being very cautious because they don't need Malik Neighbors to, A, have a concussion issue at 21 years old, continuing through here. I know people look at the concussion protocol and try to figure it out. You can't figure it out. You can't look at a high ankle sprain and compare it to a concussion. It has to be how each individual player 
is affected by that concussion. Now, Brian Dable conceded this morning, a little while ago before practice, that this was not a good concussion for Malik Neighbors. It was not a run-of-the-mill, okay, he's going to get cleared, he's not feeling symptoms. You know, it's two weeks yesterday that he suffered it in the primetime game against the Cowboys. Uh, so how does this happen? I know a lot of people want to talk about, well, Malik Neighbors is in concussion concussion protocol. He shouldn't have been at MetLife Stadium on Wednesday night uh, and been at the Travis Scott concert. Here's my feeling. Look, it's bad optics. You're in the concussion protocol. Don't go to a concert. That's what I would give my advice to my to my kids, my nephew, whatever. If I was a boss, I'd give my advice. Do I think that that has contributed to Malik Neighbor still being in the concussion protocol? No. Here's why. Phase three of the concussion protocol, which is what Malik Neighbors entered on Wednesday, includes physical activity. Now it's all about physical activity and not having symptoms after that physical activity. It's not about worrying about direct light and sensitivity to light and sensitivity to sound. A lot of people are pointing to that from the concert on Wednesday and saying, well, see, if he's having sensitivity to light and he's not, he's at a concussion protocol stage where that is behind him. He would not be outdoors at practice on the side with training staff. If it's sunny out, guys, if, if they were looking to protect him from the sensitivity of light, he would not be at that stage of protocol. So, again, if you want to complain about Malik Neighbors being at the concert on Wednesday night and how that is why he's still in the concussion protocol, complain away. But I'm just trying to give you the information that you need. Right now, the way Malik Neighbors can clear concussion protocol is do physical activity with the training staff, not feel anything, then progress to the non-contact portion of the protocol, which means he's in practice wearing a red jersey, and he's running around doing football activity. If he comes out of that feeling well, then the final stage is participating in practice under normal circumstances and then getting cleared or at least recommended by the Giants training staff that he go see an independent neurologist and get the final clearance in order to return to action. As background with all of this, is the specter of, as I mentioned, Malik Neighbors is a 20-year-old, a 21-year-old player without a history of concussions. You don't want to create a history of concussions. If this was a bad concussion, and all are bad, all concussions are bad, you can't talk about protecting the players and then want to speed up the steps. I know there's a frustration that many concussions are cleared in a week and a player comes back and doesn't miss multiple weeks. The Giants have a safety, Elijah Riley, who suffered a concussion the first week of August. He is still running on the side with the training staff trying to get cleared. And he's trying to get cleared, not necessarily to make the Giants, but he's trying to get cleared so that he can get an injury settlement and go somewhere else to play with the Gi uh, with, uh, in this league. And he's still not cleared. You can go all the way back to 2019. Sterling Shepard had two concussions in multiple weeks. It was missed five games. You need to protect Malik Neighbors. And while it is frustrating, and while the concert and the video that circulated on social media certainly complicates things, I'm telling you that Malik Neighbors is not cleared for Sunday night because he has yet to ramp up the physical activity to the point where he can get to phase four of the protocol. And that has nothing to do with his presence at a Travis Scott concert at MetLife Stadium on Wednesday night. Next week is the Philadelphia Eagles here. Saquon Barkley returns to MetLife Stadium. If the Giants can beat the Bengals without Malik Neighbors, and you say, well, how can they beat the Bengals? They just beat the Seahawks, who are a better team than the Bengals. Yes, Joe Burrow is a better quarterback. And Jamar Chase is a better receiver than DK Metcalf. But is the difference, is the margin that wide? You know, I joked last night on social media, the Giants broke Geno Smith. He did not play well in the first half last night against San Francisco. But that was a turn, tough turnaround for the Seahawks as well. If the Giants can beat 
the Bengals and get Malik Neighbors back at 3-3 three and three going into next week against the Eagles, well, then they play their cards right. The last thing you want is to rush Malik Neighbors through the protocol without feeling 100% confident that he is cleared. And now he gets a hit against the Bengals, and now he's out again, and now you're dealing with potentially two trips into the concussion protocol with the Eagles on deck, it's not the way the Giants are going to play it. So Malik Neighbors not playing means, a, a, again, a big role for Darius Slayton. Certainly performed well. Here's another one. Devin Singletary does not sound like Devin Singletary, even though he's participating in practice, is a surefire lock to play against the Bengals. So if you're in a fantasy league, fire up Tyrone Tracy again. I think Tyrone Tracy has proven – that he can take over this load and make Singletary kind of that third down back in this offense. The third down back last week was Eric Gray. If you can put Singletary in that third round back, third down back role, I think you're better off in this offense. John Runyon, after missing two days of practice because he was sick, he is back on the field at practice. The Giants' offensive line should be intact, and that is a huge weapon, guys. I know. It's been since 2008, the year after Super Bowl 42, where you could actually say the Giants' offensive line is a weapon. It is a weapon for this offense. Look what they did against Seattle last week, and look what they did in Seattle. No pre-stab penalties, no holding penalties. What Jermaine Illuminor has brought at right tackle has been tremendous. And, uh, you know, Everything offensively comes off of that offensive line. And if Daniel Jones plays well on Sunday night, you can bet it's the way that offensive line played. And big injury this week for the Giants, potentially bigger than Malik Neighbors because you now know a little bit of a timetable. Kayvon Thibodeau hurt his wrist, underwent surgery. He is out uh, for the foreseeable future, potentially a four- to six-week injury. He broke a bone in his wrist. I think he may come back sooner than that uh, and wearing a club, but you also have to be careful with that and wanting to bring guys you know, back too soon. He may end up on IR on Saturday. Uh, let's see how the Giants play that. That means an increased role for Aziz Ojolari. means more pressure on Brian Burns. We'll see how the Giants perform on the back end. I think it's very encouraging the way Tay Banks and – Cordell Flott have continued to play. Drew Phillips, Adoree Jackson, both healthy. They'll be out there on the field against the Bengals, and they're going to need to be because Joe Burrow is at a high end of his game right now, and the problems are on the defensive side of the ball for the Bengals. So can the Giants win a shootout? I think what you want to see is the Giants controlling the football. Run the football. Keep you know, keep the possession on your side. You do not want to be giving Joe Burrow five and six and seven possessions on Sunday night because that's a recipe to lose because you're not going to be expected to keep up offensively with Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. So that's what I would do. I would come out, want my offensive line to control the game, get in the end zone, you're not going to match field goals for touchdowns with the Bengals and expect to win this game. So that's kind of where we're at. Hopefully you guys got all the information you're looking for. We will have a post-game podcast. More than likely it will be Monday morning rather than Sunday night. Don't want to do that uh, to Paul Wood and our producer. I mean, you know, got to give Paul a little bit of a break on Sunday night too. He's also a giant season ticket holder, so I'm sure he's going to be excited to be in the stands. You also got the Mets on Sunday night, so we'll see how this plays out. Are you feeling any 86 vibes with the Mets and Giants playing at the same time on prime time? That was the World Series back then. Now it's uh, it's kind of a weird 24 hours at MetLife Stadium. You've got the Giants playing Sunday night. You've got the Mets playing on the West Coast, in the NLCS. Then on Monday night, you have 
the Yankees playing in the Bronx, and you have the Jets and new interim coach Jeff Ulbrich for Robert Sala playing at against the Bills at MetLife. So it's going to be a wild weekend here for the New York football teams. The season's still alive, Giants. Do you believe? Do you believe that they got a little bit of a run here the way the Mets have kind of turned their season around? Let's not forget, early on in this season, the New York Mets were given up for dead. Same thing for the Giants starting out at 0-2 and, and now 1-3. and three. You're sitting there at 2-3, and three, you got to beat the Bengals, and if you have the Eagles coming in here at 3-3, three and three, Saquon's return, feeling good about yourselves, two wins in a row, it's positivity on the deck for the Giants and Brian Dable in year three. So long way to go, big hill to climb on Sunday night to beat the Bengals, but we're all in. And I think more of you are all in than maybe you were three weeks ago. But it'll be very interesting to see how this weekend plays out. So for Paul Wood, I'm Art Stapleton. I hope you enjoyed our pregame podcast going into this weekend. We held off a little bit. We wanted to get you the injury information. That's where we're at. And Giants Bengals Sunday night. Follow all my coverage on NorthJersey.com throughout the weekend. And we will be back with a post-game podcast, more than likely on Monday morning, to set the stage for Saquon's return. Again, thanks for being all in, and we'll be all in with the Giants the rest of the weekend. Here we go. Big game. you got to live for these games to give you some something to want to root for or want to see in October and November. It's not just baseball season yet. The Giants have a chance to continue to make it football season. We'll see how they do against the Cincinnati Bengals on Sunday night.